Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I'm really delighted to be hosting this discussion uh, with Gideon Rockman about his important new book, The Age of Strongmen, How the Cult of the Leader Threatens Democracy Around the World. I suspect Gideon needs no introduction for uh, viewers today. Uh, everyone I know, in, in my circle at least, is a regular reader of Gideon's weekly Financial Times column and regular listeners to his excellent uh, podcast, The Rockman Review. If, if you don't know Gideon, he's currently the chief foreign affairs columnist for Financial Times, a position he has held since 2006. And in addition to his latest wonderful book, he has written several important previous works, including Zero Sum World, Politics, Power, and Prosperity After the Crash, and Easternization, Asia's Rise and America's Decline from Obama to Trump and beyond. This new book, which we're going to talk about today, is sadly timely and disturbing in its analysis of this most recent phase of authoritarian resurgent and some of the unique features uh, of this current epoch. Uh, the discussion, I think, is made all the more salient because of many of the significant geopolitical shifts that are right now occurring where these uh, strongman leaders have uh, an incredible amount of, of leverage and influence over the peace and stability uh, of the world. Of course, our program here focuses mainly on China, but I think one of the ways to understand China is, is through a comparative lens. It's becoming increasingly difficult to get eyes on China's political system. So I think we're grasping for new ways to begin to conceptualize some of the incentive structures, pathologies, and resiliencies and strengths uh, of China's authoritarian political system, which is why I wanted to talk to Gideon, uh, because I think this book, in looking at a number of authoritarian leaders and systems, actually shed some important light on uh, China. We've got now 58 minutes uh, in the discussion. So just a quick logistical note. Anyone who wants to ask a, a question, we very much believe in mass democracy uh, in the, the Communist Party spirit here at the Freeman Chair. So uh, if you go to CSIS.org, go to the events page and, and click on the link for this event, you'll see a box uh, where you can type in your question. Please send those in at, at any time. Uh, we'll be reviewing those and we'll try to make sure we save some time for, for Q&A. Or if something comes in that's um, relevant to the current thread of discussion, I will work that in. So without uh, without further ado, let, let's get started. And Gideon, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks thanks for inviting me. No, it's great to be doing this. And uh, I guess one positive side effect of the pandemic is we've found out we can do this kind of thing and have these Zoom meetings. So, so no, thanks thanks for having me on. I'll start with the, the obvious question before we get into the real uh, bones and, and meat of the book, which is, uh, I wonder if you could talk about the origins of the book Autocracy, autocrats have have long been a feature of international politics. Um, what was the what was the proximate and ultimate reason that you decided to start working on this book? Um, you know, it, whatever a year ago, two years ago. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess um, in a way it was an outcome of of the kind of work that I do. So I'm a if you like a political tourist. I get to move around the world, writing about different countries and often making comparisons and it struck me that um, I was having the sort of same sort of conversation in country after country albeit, albeit if they were they'd often started from very different political systems and had very different political systems but there was seemed to be a rise of populist authoritarianism so that if you were in in India for example if you were in Delhi if you were a liberal there they were very preoccupied by Modi and the personality cult he was creating and the kind of erosion of some civil liberties. And then you'd find people in Istanbul, uh, the Turkish equivalents were worried about Erdogan uh, or, or indeed Chinese liberals who suddenly felt a much chillier atmosphere in the, as she consolidated power and, uh, you know, kind of turned his back on the idea that China might liberalize and created a personality cult same in Moscow and so on. So um, I thought there's something global going on here. And that was the origins of the book. And you say, you know, well, haven't strongman leaders always existed? And that is, you know, very legitimate point. But I think there was a period, maybe from the mid 70s to about, say, the early 2000s, when it looked like this was a phenomenon that was in retreat. So if you take 
Europe, for example, at the beginning of the 70s, you had Franco and Salazar in Portugal, you know, Enver Hodja in Albania, Ceausescu in Romania. But by the 1990s, those figures have all gone. Similarly, uh, you know, Russia really hadn't had a sort of strongman figure since the death of Stalin. And, and China had appeared to have turned its back on that phenomenon after the death of Mao with a move towards sort of away from cults of personality towards a more collective style of leadership. And then there were countries like your own or India where strongman leadership was felt to be a kind of alien to the political culture and not something that would crop up. And yet suddenly it had become a global phenomenon. Just a follow-up question, Gideon. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking, it, it is another way, it, could you have written a, a, a separate but flip side of the coin book, which is sort of the age of democratic decline? In other words, is the story the rise of strongmen or is the story strongmen as a result of the breakdown of um, democratic procedures, resiliency, belief in democracy, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, the two things are obviously connected. And I know uh, you'll be familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of the audience will be familiar with uh, rather depressing annual reports by Freedom House about, the, you know, who, who begin to chart a decline in, in freedom around the world from, I think, about 2005. And I think the latest, they said, you know, we're in a 19 year democratic recession. But I think that um, this particular democratic recession is very closely associated with strongman rule, um, that that's the form it's often taking in the sense that the strongman and whether they're working in uh, a country like China, that's never had a democratic system, but that uh, maybe some aspire to move more towards a rule of law system um, and um, others who are in democracies. But one thing they have in common is that they all um, are people who kind of create a cult of personality and who say that they alone have the answers. As, as Trump put it, I alone can fix it in his speech in 2016 to the Republican convention. So therefore, trust in the judgment of the leader and if the leader needs to break the law or uh, take on the country's elite or whatever, well, that's fine because the country's in a kind of crisis when they need a strongman leader. So, yes, I think we've been in this period of democratic recession. But I, I do think that for, for reasons we can perhaps go into, it's become closely associated with a certain form of anti-democratic discourse, which is very leader fixated. So maybe uh, building on that, you just mentioned some of the this, the similarities or the um, connectivities that exist amongst these these leaders. I mean, I'm looking at the the table of contents here: Putin, Erdogan, Xi Jinping, Modi, Orban, Trump, Duterte, MBS, Bolsonaro. Of course, every one of those individuals is dramatically different from a very different background, rose to power in very distinct political systems with a unique mm -hmm. history culture we could of course focus on all the particularities uh, and the role of contingency for each of those individuals but i'm curious you've now spent this time surveying in great detail all of these leaders do you see any interconnected threads um, yeah. or connections between the leaders I, I i'm sort of an absurd comparison but let's take trump and xi jinping we would think they're dramatically different real estate mogul Communist Party apparatchik, but do you see some similarities there? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yes, and oddly enough, you know, Trump admires Xi Jinping, even as he starts a trade war with China, he's always very careful to refer to Xi as a, a somebody he gets on with, as a great leader, and so on. And, uh, you know, Fiona Hill, in her memoir of the period in the Trump White House, says that, you know, Trump constantly, or on, on several occasions, joked that maybe they should imitate China and abolish term limits for the presidency. And Fiona says, well, actually, she didn't think he was joking. He was actually like floating a trial balloon that, that, that he did think that wouldn't be such a bad idea. Um, but I think that, you know, actually not just Trump and Xi, I would, I would say there's several characteristics, but let me talk about three that are pretty constant. One is this cult of personality business. The I alone can fix it thing. And so that she doesn't just centralize power. He creates a, a cult by incorporating Xi Jinping thought into the Chinese Communist Party's constitution. You know, last time I was in China, just before the pandemic, I got friends to demonstrate to me that, you know, the Xi Jinping thought app that they, they had on their phone where they were meant to study it. And the guy I, 
who was um, showing it to me was visibly discomforted because he looked at it and he said, oh, no, I haven't logged in today, you know, because because people could monitor check that he was actually do doing his homework. Um, and, uh, you know, that, for example, there was an exhibition in Wuhan to, to mark a year after the, as they saw it, uh, the, the, the outbreak of the pandemic and then its control. And it was about how China had done much better than, than the West. And now that looks a bit uh, trickier as a judgment now. But but it was, if you read, say, the accounts of that um, that festival, it was very much, this is Xi Jinping's doing. This it was Xi's wise leadership that took us through this. So again, the personality cult thing, you know, in, in India, again, it's, it's actually it's still democracy. It has elections. But you know, the largest sports stadium in the country is called the Narendra Modi Stadium. If you get vaccinated in India, the vaccination certificate has, has Modi's face on it. You know, it's it, the, the message is India's Modi, Modi is India. Same with Putin in, in, in Russia, that he is the savior of the nation. Really, you, you can't do without him. So it's that leader cult, I think, is crucial. Secondly, I think, and again, it's something that she and, and Trump actually do have in common, is what I call a nostalgic nationalism. You know, Trump says, make America great again. But in different ways, a lot of these leaders are saying that. So Xi's thing is the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, that we're making our comeback after the century of humiliation, and I'm the person going to lead us to the completion of that comeback. Uh, but, you know, what is Putin about if not trying to restore Russian greatness? Um, Erdogan similarly has a vision, you know, that Turkey had a historic great period, the Ottoman period, some People say this is a form of neo-Ottomanism that he is practicing. So there's there, th those things. And then I think there's also often a rhetoric of national crisis. So that if you combine the sense that there is the, this great leader, and secondly, uh, that we were great before and he's going to lead us back. And then third, you say there's a national crisis, uh, American carnage, if you like, or if in, in Xi's case, uh, the sense that now COVID or, or before that, that the world was sort of ganging up on China, that then creates the pretext, if you like, to take extreme measures, whether it's a state of emergency or whatever. And so, yes, I think that, that there is uh, uh, quite a lot in common. And it's actually one of the things that surprised me writing the book, because, you know, obviously you, you kind of constantly have to question your thesis as you go along to, before others do it for you. And one of the things that, that, that I had to ask is, you know, is it legitimate to make these comparisons across countries that are so different? Um, but then as I came across the sort of similarities in the pictures and also um, the extent to which these leaders often kind of have a respect for each other, I thought, yeah, there's definitely something common here. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on the, this question of cult of personality. As you were talking, I was thinking in August 1968, the then Pakistani foreign minister came to Beijing and gifted Mao Zedong a crate of mangoes. And, and within days, you had this explosion of worship of mangoes in China, obviously as an instantiation of the greatness of Mao. I, I, I've interviewed a few Red Guards who were uh, who saw Mao in person in 1966, where he made a series of um, appearances at the Gate of Heavenly Peace, Tiananmen in Beijing. And they told me that they, they, they were literally crying at the sight of him. So I, that's the model I think of, of a cult of personality. Yeah. And then I think of Xi Jinping. And the thing about a cult is you need cult members. Yeah. Uh, and a Xi Jinping app is very far from the, the mango hysteria. Cool. I, I'm not trying to um, argue the point. I'm, I'm trying to understand when we use cult of personality, um, I think our mental model is, is Stalin, you know, at the height of his power, is Mao at the point where he was literally being worshipped as a, as a near deity. The, the um, element of cult that we see today in these modern dictators or autocrats seems much more of a, of a push than a pull in in terms of um in terms of belief in this i wanted to know is that assessment right or, or do you see elements of of devotion that i'm missing and maybe we did with trump to be honest um and if they don't have that level of mal like cult what does it tell us about their grip on uh on, on power yeah no i think that's a very useful corrective actually jude i mean i, I think it's not the same and maybe it can never be the same in a society that is as connected as, a, as modern China is. I mean, obviously, China was so sort of sealed off back then. 
a much simpler society with you know uh, without social media without connections to the world that they they have now so yeah i don't uh, you know it's not it's not the same but i think that there is a certain um nostalgia for the mao period that you see uh, you know, people thought that was sinister about Bo Chi Lai, and then little did they know that actually she, who was meant to be saving them from Bo Chi Lai, also had had some of that about him. And I think that, you know, maybe the creation of a kind of modern cult of personality, if you like, one which is much less intense than before that, is an effort of consolidation of power. I mean, obviously, everyone has formative years, and maybe, you know, some people who went through the Cultural Revolution were were appalled by it and were completely in revolt against it for the rest of their lives. But others like she and maybe Bo Chi Lai felt, you know, there was something about it that 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 they quite liked. And um and so he's trying to create a modern version of that. But that might just be an effort of consolidation of power. And how much people actually believe it in a more cynical era. I mean obviously you have this whole uh, Winnie the Pooh um, meme that occasionally surfaces on Chinese media that they then repress I, uh, because it, it's it's taking you know the the Mickey uh, making fun of 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 Xi now you know I can't believe that would have been possible in the Mao era um, but maybe it is about Xi trying to find different ways to consolidate power another would be the anti-corruption drive and just simply arresting people. That, that are uh, another would be, you know, strengthening the the role of the Communist Party further in institutions of the state. It's a different means, but I think that for him, obviously, what he's about to do is a break with recent precedent. What by which I mean, staying on in power. It's not what the two predecessors do. So to, to he has to find a justificatory mechanism for that, and the justificatory mechanism is the claim to be indispensable. Um, and uh, so whether the people who repeat all this or who look at the app or, um, you know, create the propaganda around them, whether internally they believe it, I, I just don't know. Um, but, but in a way, it's a form of assertion of power. If you can get people to vote your thought into the Constitution yeah. to all say publicly that, um, you know, you're a great man. And I remember kind of early indication to me that wow things are kind of going wrong was there was one of these very stilted meetings with uh Ch visiting chinese officials to london uh, i'm sure you've had lots of equivalents lots of people on this call will have been and things like that but it was where the number of references they were making to xi jinping thought or to things that she had said and i thought look you're all intelligent people you know you wouldn't be doing this spontaneously um it was it was creepy um and and it was clearly something that was that was being ordained so no it's it's not it's not Mao it's not Stalin but it is a departure and I think it tells you both about authoritarianism and about Xi's role in that it, it also um it strikes me that when many of us in liberal democracies head scratch at the r resiliency of autocratic systems, I think there's often a failure to understand that while in our mental map, there's this universal yearning for, for freedom. Yeah. I think that's in many cases largely true. There's another tendency that humans have, which is uh, um, uh, striving for security and order. Yeah. And I think you, we go in these waves where we forget that latter lesson. Um, or at least the intellectual elite in modern democracies do. And that's where we get into these, you know, periodic fits of nailing jello to a wall, you know, uh, some of the, the hubris of the 1990s, but frankly, hubris that exists to this day. And I think uh, this maybe is a transition to my next question, which is about the extent to which perceptions, and I'm, I'm going to focus on China, Russia here, because my knowledge of all the other countries you profile is close to zero. Um, but you mentioned that your third leg of your uh, of, of the connections between these leaders, cult of personality, nostalgia, and crisis. Um, yeah. It seems that as you were talking about Xi Jinping's value proposition for staying in power, at the margin, I would imagine he might see some benefit in 
the the more aggressive U.S. posture vis-a-vis China because it makes a, a domestic bandwagoning again at the margin. It, it certainly creates headaches and difficulties that he has yeah. to navigate. But in terms of articulating this value proposition, it seems like a very primal, um, uh, um, a primal sort of story to say there are barbarians at the gate, comrades. Um, now is not the time to, to to for a change of captain. Now is a time to you know dig in our heels, lock our arms, and prepare for battle. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a bit about how crisis is exploited by uh, Putin, by Xi, and, and by these others. And I think a related question to that is, we discuss or we frame the worldview of Xi and Putin as one of paranoia, right? Yeah. Paranoia about the West. I find that a little bit uh, um, if I can say it this way, a little bit unfair because there is an extraordinarily robust record of attempts by Western governments, especially the United States, to subvert political systems that we find illegitimate or, or dangerous. Um, so we call it paranoia, but I wonder, you know, for Putin and Xi, are they wrong to be seeing this as a real lock? battle between systems where one side is hell bent on seeing the the undercutting or the overthrow or the demise of their political systems sorry that was that, that was more that was more of a comment than a question but yeah, no no the, but, but the questions in there and interesting stuff to talk about i mean on that sort of i sort of split the difference on the paranoia versus justification theory i mean in the sense that if you look at uh, you know, I know that's the, the joint statement they issued, which uh, you and lots of others will have read very closely on in February. Um, they they do have this joint fixation on color revolutions as uh, the West being out to get them. And so you're right that um, the West has a record of, um, you know, going back a long way of of working to undermine regimes that it doesn't like. Um, uh, Maybe genuinely held that these color revolutions were entirely the work of the United States, you know, that uh, that that, uh, you know, I remember Chinese telling me that in Hong Kong, for example, that that the CIA was behind it and that you could tell this because food trucks were arriving to give the demonstrators food and who was organizing that. And you'd hear similar things that the Russians would say about the people showing up in the Maidan. And that's, you know, that is a rather too convenient explanation. I I don't think America is capable of bringing three million people out onto the streets of Hong Kong. Uh, There were real grievances there. Um, So, um, you know, maybe they're conspiratorial enough to believe that, or maybe it's just the only acceptable explanation they can come up with. Otherwise, people genuinely do, you know, want change that they're not prepared to give them. But that said, I mean, I think that things that we regard as as innocent and just what we do, you know, like giving help to civil society organizations or whatever, if you're sitting in the Kremlin or, uh, you know, in power in Beijing, that does look a bit threatening. These are, these are the people who are, after all, organizing against you. Um, and um and yeah that that you know there there is a fairly often articulated hope that there will be political change in these countries uh, and obviously that that means that at some point they these people go but um so yeah i'd kind of split the 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 difference on that i think that um they are a little bit paranoid but not you know even paranoid people have enemies um I wanted to move on and ask a, a question about, I, I guess, largely focused on China, but I think there's a, a, a broader implication for this. There seems to be some sort of conflicted view we have about authoritarianism. On the one hand, we, and I mean we in, in Western liberal democracies, often state that we find it abhorrent, it's antithetical to our values and beliefs, but we go through these moments, especially when we're finding that our um, we're facing our own economic political headwinds or or when we're frustrated that our political institutions just aren't, quote, working. There seems to be this, um, this um, pining for some elements of authoritarian efficiency. 
Mm. We've gone through this on China. I don't think anyone has done this on Russia, although there is some admiration in the American right for Putin. Uh, the um, cultural stuff rather than the cultural uh, stuff rather than governance stuff on China, yeah. though it, it typically we've had these periods. We had it in, in the wake of the global financial crisis. There was this real rise of debate over the China model and was it superior? Mm. Um, I seem to remember Ian Bremmer not that long ago writing a cover article on Time saying that, you know, China won, the West lost. I really um, missed that one. Yeah, yeah, just two or three years ago. The timing was a bit odd, I have to say. Um, and it seems to be at l at less necessarily a deep understanding of China's governance institutions and more of a lament for the inability of democratic institutions. But yeah. I wanted to ask you how you come down on this. I, is should we fear autocracies rise or and you've written about this recently there seems to be the seeds of autocracy's own destruction in some of the non-institutionalization and um, mm. some of the challenges of legitimacy so should we be thankful we don't live in autocracies um, or should we be fearful that authoritarian systems are gunning for us yeah, well, I mean, that, you know, sometimes it seems to me that we're in a competition, you know, not not between two strong systems, but between two weak systems. And the question is, whose system will prove weaker than than the other? So that, you know, the US obviously does look very troubled at the moment. You've got the January 6th hearings going on and um, and concerns about, uh, you know, everything from gun massacres to uh, homelessness, etc. It's 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 hard to look at America and say it's Nirvana. But um but equally, the, the flip side is then to assume, well, obviously China is, 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 has got it right. I mean, they, they have their own problems, um, you know, from now somehow ending up with a zero COVID policy that imprisons 24 million people in Shanghai for two months. Or um, clearly there, there are financial problems piling up, a slowing economy, you know, the litany. Um, and uh, so I think that it's almost natural to think, well, if one is, is in trouble, the other must must be doing well. You know, it's possible we're both in trouble in different ways. But on the question of, you know, the, the, the West sort of flirting with um, authoritarianism or occasionally thinking maybe there's an authoritarian model out there. I mean, this is a very, very old story. Obviously, you know, in the 1930s, you had people who were looking at the Soviet Union as, you know, rapid industrialization or Mussolini getting the trains to run on time. There is often a sort of Western liberal or democratic self-disgust that kicks in because our, our societies do have flaws and problems. Um, and, you know, maybe it's it's good that we're able to at least consider the idea that we can learn from others. And then there's always a few model authoritarians. You know, the one that, uh, that Western capitalists tend to love is Lee Kuan Yew, uh, you know, who is uh, revered by people like, you know, Kissinger and Graham Allison and Bob Blackwell go off and do interviews with him about what, what a great guy he was. And, and Singapore is a, a pretty amazing place. Uh, uh, you know, you could others have pointed at Paul Kagame in Africa. I mean, all these people also have their critics. Uh, uh, but um, but I think the, uh, the broader point I would make is that the for every Kagame or more Lee Kuan Yew, the, 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 there are probably more examples of strongman leaders who get it badly wrong. And I think that the, you know, democracy's characteristic flaw is paralysis, division, uh, you know, sort of self-disgust that the, why can't we fix gun control? You know, we've been worrying about it for 40 years. Uh, you know, how, how do we get into problems like that? You know, if we had a, a leader who could at least exert some authority, they could do the sensible thing. But the, the characteristic problem of the strongman system is over concentration of power um, and inability to change the leader if something goes wrong. And also the fact that the leader, the longer they stay in power, the more likely they are to become a megalomaniac, frankly, or to make some terrible error. And we've seen that with Putin. I mean, you could have argued until very recently that Putin had stabilized Russia, that okay, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a huge economic success, but there was a, a Russian middle class that even on the ruthless stuff, he'd, he'd judged it quite well. The intervention in Syria, the annexation of Crimea, there was a kind of cult of Putin. This is a guy who really knows what he's doing. I think Rudy Giuliani said, uh, you know, that's real leadership that he's showing. And yet he then makes, he oversteps the mark. He gets it wrong. And the, uh, I think Russia's now going to go backwards economically. It's internationally isolated. Thousands of Russians have died in his war. 
Um, and yet there's no mechanism for saying, okay, guy, you got this wrong, next, please, because of, of the way that a strongman leader entrenches himself in power and makes himself invulnerable and, and so on. So I would argue, uh, the, being a Western liberal, I guess, that in the end, that system is more dangerous and more flawed than uh, democratic systems, which undoubt, undoubtedly also have their problems. You anticipated my next few questions where I wanted you to uh, grade Putin and Xi Jinping as geopolitical strategists. And, and I, what you've just said um, also, I think, matches how many are now viewing Xi Jinping. You just have to rewind the clock a year or two. Uh. And I think the conventional wisdom would have been on Russia, as you say, Putin is a strategist who is playing a, a bad hand very, very well. Right. Mm. Um, with Xi Jinping, I just think you need to rewind, uh, um, you know, to just before COVID. And, and the assessment would have been Xi Jinping is driving the, the, the train on a, towards a destination of, you know, global domination, um, marshalling extraordinary resources, uh, modernizing the People's Liberation Army, um, utilizing China's state capitalist system to make significant inroads in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, consolidating power at home. Everything looked to be going right. Now, I think the conventional wisdom would have done a fairly significant direction change. And um, if I can quote from what you wrote about Putin very recently, you said it feels like Russia has come full circle back to the autocracy, aggression, and isolation that defined the Soviet era. You wrote a column on Xi Jinping not that long ago where you argued in much the same vein that Xi Jinping's um, concentration on power, you know, his, his the, the, the mathematical isolation that comes along with dictatorship, which leaves you in an information poor ecosystem for decision making was taking China in a, in a dangerous direction. Uh, I guess the first question is, were Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin good strategists who have just become imprisoned in the political system that they helped create to keep them in power? Or did we have an incomplete understanding of them and we're now seeing the full blossoming of Xi Jinping and, and Putin once they now have a free free hand to play? In other words, did the are they the, the victims of their own system or were we grading them on a curve and, and now we're finally seeing the limitations of their strategic foresight? Well, I think it's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, as you know, there are all sorts of theories about Putin. But, but it was interesting that just before the war broke out, when the intelligence agencies were saying accurately that uh, he was about to do this, a lot of um, Ru people who really knew Russia were saying, no, no, he won't do this. You know, I've studied this guy for 20 years. I've lived in Moscow. I remember talking to, to ambassadors who were fresh out of Moscow three days before the invasion, who were convinced that the, the Putin they knew would not do this, that he was, he was a risk taker, he was ruthless, but this was so self-evidently crazy that he wouldn't do that. Uh, now, what happened? We don't know. Maybe he just miscalculated that he thought that, um, you know, just as he had rolled into Crimea in three days, he could do the same in Ukraine and that that was a miscalculation, but it wasn't crazy. Maybe another theory is, you know, is that he got isolated during the COVID period and sort of stewed over, his, you know, nas his nationalist theories or, or, or whatever. Or maybe, as I was saying earlier, that if you're in power for 20 years, you can go a bit crazy, frankly. You know, and that the Putin who wouldn't have done this uh, in 2004-05 has begun to feel sort of omnipotent um, by 2022. Um, but I think it's an important lesson for Xi Jinping, for how we look at Xi Jinping and what we might anticipate that he would do. Because if you obviously Taiwan is there, Ukraine, if you like. Um, and a lot of people have all. be such a roll of the dice that that he would never do that well i think we now see that actually a leader you think wouldn't take these very extreme measures actually might um now they're different people but i think it's just worth keeping
keeping that in mind, if you think uh, this authoritarian leader that you have an understanding, even based on the fact they've been around for you know a decade now, um, people can change over the course of a decade. Um, and also the international situation around them changes. I mean, I think that you know you framed it in your question, are they trapped by their own systems? There may be an element of that that they need the the legitimiz legitimization buzz of you know if your if your pitch is I'm going to make the country great again, then at some point you may feel the need to deliver, and if you don't deliver, maybe you feel under threat. But I think the other thing is the changing international environment. I think that both leaders shared an analysis of Western weakness that uh, you know if you put together. Uh, really going back to the financial crisis in China's case, but then you have um, the, the pandemic and, and what they see as the West failed reaction to that. You have the disputed presidential election. You have the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, and the chaotic nature of that. You have the sense that successive American leaders are pulling back from the Middle East. And you have a lot of people in both Moscow and Beijing who badly want to believe in the decline of the West and who are kind of uh, writing stuff, ramping it up, and you're surrounded by them, You maybe you convince yourself, well, you know what, this is our moment. Yeah, I, I think one of the really important analytical, methodological challenges moving forward will be to try to create some imperfect metric to measure that phenomenon of, are we seeing Xi Jinping in other areas start to demonstrate behavior that looks like um, we're seeing some of the same epistemological, analytical decision-making challenges that we might see in a in a in a foreign policy initiative. Yeah, and if I can make a plea to political scientists out there, it's always seemed to me that you know I have somebody to, who studied history, and historians have never had a, a real problem, or not most of them, unless they're Marxists, with with incorporating the idea that an individual can influence events. Yeah. Whereas I think political scientists have been slightly shy of of because they're very interested in systems and big forces, in actually saying, you know, the character of a leader, the decisions of a leader, some of them quite contingent, can really matter. You know, as yeah. somebody put it to me in another context, you know, if Zelensky had been a different person who totally. had done an Ashraf Ghani and just left, you know, uh, the whole of the, the story would have been different. Yeah, that, that sort of structure versus agency debate is hard, is hard to get right. Um, I, I'm only gonna hold up a prop because I, there's there's a, a scholar up at Columbia whose work I really like. Um, her first book, and this is not a, a sales pitch. I just I, I was actually just reading her book for a workshop yeah. we're doing. But who fights for reputation, which right. is about the role that um, uh, perceptions of reputation matter for for specific individual leaders in in the middle of international conflict. And she's got another great book called Knowing the Adversary: um, Leaders Intelligence. Now, <laughs> so it, I mean, they're great because actually they. Gideon, they get a little bit, uh, she's not a, a China scholar per se, but they get a bit into this, um, A, the structural difficulties of assessing intentions from, from rivals, but B, in, in the book on uh, who fights for reputation, injecting some of that agency into this. And like, individual leaders are going to navigate, you know, run the same scenario 10 times over, but put five different individuals in, you're going to get very different outcomes. Yeah. I, I think that just the piggyback on something you just said on which I completely agree with on the the warning or the lesson vis-a-vis um, -vis Xi Jinping that we should probably be thinking about in relation to Putin's uh, decision now in, in in hindsight but actually in foresight does it disastrous or costly one I probably tend to have an overly rationalistic view of how Xi Jinping is thinking about Taiwan right costs are too high um, you know, this would sidetrack many of the other items on Xi Jinping's broader agenda. Look, if you want to, if you want to rejuvenate China and, and really make it a global world power, launching a war 90 miles off your shore and bringing in the United States it, it is probably the fastest way to call that in question. But that may not be the right way to think about this, right? The right way to think about this is what information is feeding up into Xi Jinping. Um, we don't entirely understand his incentive and decision-making structure. Um, so um, look, leaders in democratic systems with open media environments make disastrous foreign, foreign policy decisions all the time, see United States and, and Iraq. Um, so it, it, it does seem to me that 
we need to widen the aperture. At least those of us looking at China specifically need to widen the aperture um, in how we're thinking about decision making processes. Because yeah. I just worry, and, and again, I see this tendency in myself that I'm going to impute how I think he should be thinking and yeah. substitute that for how what he might actually be thinking. And indeed, in a system such as that, where the only people who's going to be around him will be loyalists, people who um, you know, have been rewarded for, for, for loyalty, well, one of the characteristics of loyalists is to tell the boss sort yeah. of what they want to hear. Um, and and if, if he wants to hear that, um, uh, you know, that, that China's strong and that it's capable of doing this, maybe. Well, I mean, we, we've just seen a, a relatively recent intelligence failure for Beijing in, I think it's clear, signing the, the February 4th joint statement just mere yeah. weeks before Putin was going to launch an all-out invasion yeah. was at, at either Xi Jinping was buying what Putin was selling. Um, but even if, even if Putin said, look, this is going to be a quick mop-up operation, we've done this before, you know, comrade, special military operation will be in and out. Even if that was the case, there was still no one else in the system in China who was saying, you know, um, the, you know, the Russian army might underperform here. Um, mm. The Ukrainian people might put up more of a resistance than we thought. No one in the system either saw or was willing to say that. So we've already had a small taste um, of what a cowed political system might look like. Cool. Um, we've got we got about 15-ish minutes left, Gideon, and I, actually I want to clumsily segue into asking you about the China-Russia relationship. Um, especially, you know, a snapshot of how you're assessing this in J June 23rd, um, you know, now we're some four months on from, from the invasion, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. There still, I sense, is a, is a debate that falls on two sides here. I think many still see the, the China-Russia relationship as a, as a marriage of convenience, one that is fairly thin and transactional and or is just uh, hinging on the personal relationship of Putin and Xi Jinping. There's the other side, uh, which sees this as having some real strategic legs driven by not only that deep relationship between Putin and Xi, but a shared vision for the international security uh, you know, architecture for uh, the international order and a shared grievance um, about the U.S.-led order. There's people in between the spectrum, but but if I could simplify, I wanted to ask where, where do you come down on this? How are you um, how are you um, look seeing the integrity and robustness of of that relationship? And do you see this as having some miles left in it, or or has the war in Ukraine really started to put some some cracks in that relationship? Uh, no, I'm more to the second end. I think that uh, there is a real identity of interest, and in that it will prove quite durable. Or if you want to call it a marriage of convenience, it might continue to be convenient for really quite a long time. Uh, and I think, you know, that there are probably two things, uh, baskets that you could say, bring them together. The first would be ideological and the second would be geopolitical. I think ideologically, uh, they share this belief that the US led world order is a threat to them. We talked about, you know, do they really believe that America is sponsoring color revolutions? Uh, I think they do, you know, that uh, and that they think that it's kind of a fight to the death, if you like, that if they just sit there, that the U.S. or something will will try to, to overthrow them. So there's that resentment at what they regard as American ideological imperialism. But then secondly, there's the geopolitical thing that I think both Russia and China are not happy with the U.S.-led world order that they believe gives America too much power. It's connected to that first sense of fear about their own survival. Um, and so in different ways, they both want to reorder their regional orders, uh, you know, that Russia wants to reassert Russian power in Europe, push back against uh, um, America, and that's partly what's driving Ukraine. And China wants to do the same in its neighborhood, you know, assert dominance over the South China Sea, give itself the room to take over Taiwan if, they, if that were possible. Um, and collectively, I think that they see the work of one as beneficial to the other, that uh, you know, America does appear to be overstretched around the world. So the more that you can preoccupy them in several theaters at once, it helps both sides if you can do that. And that at times they will join together to push back, even if it's something as visible as a joint air patrol in the Pacific. So I think that, yeah, the two do have quite a lot in common and that that analysis 
will last, although it gets back to this question of personalities. You know, I think that there is or does appear to be a, a strong personal bond between Xi and Putin, and it's partly because they have similar outlooks on the world and partly because they're similar rulers, as, as Alex Ga Gabuev of... Uh, you know, the Carnegie group said that the meeting on February the 4th was the Tsar and the Emperor. You know, this was uh, two people who felt they embodied their nations and had a similar views of what their nation should be doing domestically and internationally. So if one of them were to go, that might change things. Can I ask you to um, uh, follow a few threads of the course of the war and how those might affect the trajectory of that relationship? Um, and what some of the broader implications will be. I hate always coming back to Taiwan in these discussions, but it's the issue it's the issue that that everyone is thinking about now. Mm. Um, and again, this comes off of your excellent recent podcast on the extent to which European unity will will last, mm. which I think is something China is certainly watching to see sure. um, and, and how that might factor into its own calculations on other unrelated areas. China Russia relationship. Um, and the broader implications under a scenario where um, Putin achieves something that we would call a victory um, and and um, and where we see transatlantic unity or unity within Europe disintegrate because high energy prices, inflation, economic slowdown, fatigue. Um, what are the implications of that, do you think, for the China-Russia relationship and or China's own calculations? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so my guess, you know, and obviously we are sort of all trying to put ourselves in Xi's shoes, but the, the, is that a swift Russian victory would have been best, you know, that it would have another demonstration of American impotence after Afghanistan, a sense that the world was changing, and also that America's monopoly on the use of force uh, had, 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 had ended globally, that, you know, just a uh, that others can 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 uh, you know do deploy their armies de topple regimes etc. That would have been great. Uh, then I think that they will have been discomforted by the sense of the West uh, rallying, uniting, imposing sanctions on uh, Russia. But uh, we're going, we've gone through several phases. We're only four months in, and now of course it looks like Russia might have redefined its goals and will be able to you know, at huge cost to both sides, possibly cripple Ukraine without the West being able to achieve our stated goal of preserving Ukraine as a sovereign independent state. I mean, it may, it may, there may still be an independent Ukraine, but it'll be a very damaged place. Now, of course, it could look very, very different again in a couple of months time. But I think the, the, the Chinese must be hoping that the Russians emerge uh, not looking defeated. And frankly, you know, they will also be looking very closely at this Western sanctions effort. If the West had managed to destroy the Russian economy in short order, or still is able to do that, that sends a message that China doesn't really want about the continued power of the West collectively in the international system, the centrality of the dollar, the fact that we still seem to hold the levers. On the other hand, if you flip it and say, actually, if our effort to bring Russia down fails, that's actually quite a welcome message to China that we in the West have fired our best shot and it hasn't killed Putin, you know, metaphorically. Um, and so that that then allows them to say, well, you know, so much for this all powerful West. Russia's still here. They haven't been able to stop them. And I think that will actually actually build their confidence over time. And of course, I think they'll be learning a lot of practical lessons about, OK, what kind of sanctions might the West impose? Where are our vulnerabilities? What do we need to fireproof ourselves against some of that? Yeah, I mean, he hearing you, Gideon, it, it reminds me that the the only honest response to the question of what is China learning from the war in Ukraine is it's it's too early to tell. Yeah, um, as Joe uh, and Lai famously didn't say. As Joe and Lai famously <laughs> said of the French Revolution. Um, can I just quickly ask you to go the other side of this now? Um, something that we, again, I realize there's a lot of um, specifics you'd need to know, but let's lump something in as Russian defeat. Um, uh, European transatlantic solidarity holds. Um, we continue to see, maybe we see an increase in armament or support for, for Ukraine by Europe and the United States. Um, uh, Putin has to dramatically scale back uh, and, and begin to withdraw troops. Um, I won't say his position in power is threatened. Let's just call this a blanket sort of defeat for for the war effort. 
um, uh, guess as to implications for the Russia-China relationship and or China's own thinking about its own designs uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's obviously a much less favorable scenario for them. Um, I would guess they would begin to distance themselves a little bit from the loser um, and say, well, you know, he didn't tell us he was going to do this, whatever. Um, but I think that they would also symbolically try to separate themselves from Russia and say, you know, as, as Chinese friends were saying to me early in the war when Russia was doing really badly, well, you know, it's a kind of broken down old country. Their weapons don't even work. We're a really different proposition. You know, we're modern. We're rich. Don't believe we would be as weak as as Russia because we won't be. And th there may be something in that. You know, they're not the same place. They may have an identity of interest. Um, but what I don't think you would see, although it would be nice, is China saying, you know what, maybe the liberal world order is a good thing and we'll abandon <laughs> our ambitions on Taiwan. That that ain't going to happen. Um, but they would obviously have to recalibrate, I think, and um, they would be feel relatively friendless, I think, that, you know, that Russia was a very, very important, is an important ally for them. Um, and, you know, as one Chinese diplomat put it to me you know, quite wistily, he said, you know, America's proposition on this war is please help us to destroy our friend Russia right. so that we can turn on you next. And, you know, if we're not going to do that. Sorry. Um, so that's how I think they'll see it. Final question, which which I realize this this next question in and of itself could be the focus of an entire hour. But I wanted to ask you about the next phase of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, we're, we're clearly we've moved out of the pre-2016 consensus on on engagement. We then went to the Trump uh, Trump era, which was this sort of liminal wrenching away from the existing you know, structures and, and orientation of the bilateral relationship. Biden has consolidated some elements of the Trump um, Trump position, although I think there are as many differences as there are as there are similarities. But broadly speaking, I think it's clear here in the United States, in Beijing and in other capitals that the U.S. and China are settling in for some type of uh, intense competition or or rivalry. Um, one of the discussions now is trying to conceptualize the, the the spectrum of the competition, and that's where the Russia element comes in. Here is this now a multi-front competition for the United States that that you know extends this arc of autocracy, um, or is this still all in on the Indo-Pacific, and we need to start thinking about prioritization? Um, as you look at all of these moving parts, we finally got speeches coming out of the administration. China yesterday or two days ago launched its sort of 21 critiques of U.S. policy. There's a lot of moving parts, um, and, and each one of them is quite difficult to grab onto and understand, let alone how they fit into each other. But if you could keep your prognostication hat on, I wanted to ask, how are you thinking about what this new phase of the U.S.-China relationship looks like? Are we now, as some are arguing, heading into this very, very dangerous decade where the best possible outcome is we avoid an outright hot war over something like Taiwan? Or is that not the way to think about this? And this still is a multi-decade, um, multi-faceted sort of geostrategic economic competition or something else? I, I would incline to the sort of dangerous decade view myself. I mean, I've been a bit struck taken aback by talking to people who are pretty level-headed who, who do think that things are heading heading in a dangerous direction and, you know a friend of mine who uh, maybe i won't quote him directly but but who's um you know a strategic thinker out, out in asia based in singapore and uh and just said very matter-of-factly that he thought there would be a conflict you know um and uh, I, I was taken aback, actually. I said, you, come on, you, you sure about that? And he said, yeah, you know, it just, just feels like there's too, it's just getting too hot. Something's going to happen. Um, now, maybe we've all been over-influenced by what happened in Ukraine. There's a sort of catastrophism in the air. And obviously, China um, doesn't have to behave the way that Russia did. Um, but uh, it does feel like the two sides have decided that the other is an adversary i mean i think one you know but then it's worth thinking through the differences i mean 
one is this extent of inter economic interconnectedness. Uh, you know, in a way, Russia's economic relationship with the West was pretty simple. It was a you know petrol station and uh, and a consumer market. But the China is so incorporated into Western supply chains, you have to wonder whether maybe that will have some sort of constraining uh, effect. Secondly, I think that America will have been pleased with Russia that all its European allies lined up with it, but they will have to consider in a confrontation with China, would how much of Asia would line up with the United States? And that may act as a constraint. And I think that the the Chinese may feel there's still some mileage to go in the traditional strategy of just trying to build up economic weight, sort of create facts on the ground so that you never have to fight, that you can sort of create an inevitability and so on, and that that then gives them the patience to, to just play a long game on Taiwan and to, to gradually, say, build out their trade relationships build little bases, you know, whether it's in the Solomon Islands or Cambodia or whatever, to do it a salami slicing technique and feel that they can get to their goals without risking this major confrontation. So that's a, a plausible scenario. I mean, I think that that, that would require a degree of intelligence and uh, patience on the Chinese leadership, but they've shown that in the past. Um, and I think uh, you know, I don't think America's spoiling for a fight. So it might be that we get to live with this very tense, very ambiguous situation for quite a long time without actually getting into the confrontation. I'd certainly obviously hope that. Yeah, the new the new cliche around town is, you know, how do we get to early 70s detente without the 62 missile crisis? Yeah. Um, and I think, again, some of the worry here is, you know, even for those who are critical of U.S. policy being too aggressive, uh, but on both sides, I've heard it, you know, a worry that it may take something like that um, until we finally recognize that the, the, the real fundamental danger in this relationship continuing to get hot. And then the other great concern, I think, is um, we don't entirely know how Xi Jinping will govern after the 20th Party Congress. You, you, there's two discrepant um, uh, theses about maybe once he gets through the 20th party congress he can be sort of late late mao era you know late era mao where he now has the not worried about domestic competition not worried about rivals can take a much more patient long term approach the other is he will be unconstrained and this is a leader who has a, a profound sense of urgency to get stuff done um and, and maybe wants to achieve some of these significant milestones on his watch which will be you know another decade or so but um you know, for if you're thinking about something like Taiwan, that's not a whole lot of time. So, so right now, I think those debates are very much playing out, and unfortunately, they're irrelevant because we won't know it till we see it, and we're going to have to wait. Um, yeah. Gideon, uh, I want to end on time so I can let you get on with your with your work day, but um, I just want to say, uh, I think for anyone who's trying to understand, even if you're just focused on China, what I found so illuminating it about this book is it was in the case studies of other systems that as you know, Gideon laid out early, you begin to see the connective tissue uh, between this, this, this age of, of autocracy and strongmen. Uh, but this is also just a tour de force uh, a view of the world right now in this dangerous moment um, that we're in. So I wish I didn't have to recommend this book. Um, and, and hopefully you'll be writing the age of democratic resilience, you know, five years from now. That would be good, wouldn't it? Um, but until then, um, uh, thank you very much for, for all that you're writing and your, your sober and sharp eyed analysis on the pages of the FT in this book and in your podcast. Uh, and um, I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation. And thank you all for joining us and see you at a, a future uh, undetermined uh, CSAS Freeman Chair event. Have a, have a great day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thanks.